Hello, everyone. Boy. Pardon? Mask. I can, I can take off the mask. I was about to say, it's like, uh, maybe I want to keep it on. I hear it takes, uh, it takes five years off. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm rusty at this, folks. Please bear with me. It's, it's been a while, all right? So thanks, everyone, for joining us for yet another author talk uh, on this nice autumn evening. Uh, I'm Eric Rao. I'm the director of library services here at Hagley, where we preserve and share the story of American enterprise, the unfolding history of American business, technology, and innovation, and its impact on the world. Um, our collections cover the entire range of American commerce and enterprise, uh, recorded on paper, film, tape, um, the printed word, the digital file, you name it, whatever the format, it's here and we preserve them all. Uh, our mission encompasses not only collecting and preserving great collections and historical records, but also um, developing events that put our audiences in touch with the stories that these uh, collections tell. Events like the one that you're about to experience. Um, Roger Horowitz, whom you'll hear from next, will have more to say about this, but our speaker tonight had an important hand in ensuring that the Avon Products, Inc. archive made the trip to Hagley, uh, ensuring their preservation. But again, spoiler alert, so and all that, and I, I'll shut up now. Um, the installment of, this installment of our uh, author talk lecture series, like most of the library's programming, is organized by the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, which translates to Roger Horowitz, who's its director, Carol Lockman, center manager who checked you in tonight, uh, and Gregory Hargreaves, the um, program, uh, programming officer who's uh, selling books at the back table tonight. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank them for putting on tonight's event. And I'd also like to be... Uh, also very grateful for other staff members at Hagley for helping out, facilities management, our friends at Showworks, um, and so on, who often labor in obscurity, but are absolutely essential for making sure that things go off without a hitch. Um, but we're especially grateful to you for making time for us on this evening, and uh, we hope that we see you again in other installments of the author talks and other programming um, throughout the year. So if you uh, want to make sure that you hear about all the good stuff we're doing, uh, consider becoming a member. You'll find uh, information about, well, is there information out, Roger? Or? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So, sorry, I forgot to check before I came up here. Um, and um, also, please let us know what do you think about tonight's event. Uh, you'll have noticed when you took your seat that there is actually an evaluation form, and just let us know what you think. Um, we'll be grateful for it. In the meantime, please join me in retrieving your devices, right, and setting them to stun or silence. Uh, for the courtesy of your fellow audience members and uh, your speaker tonight. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Roger Horowitz up to the podium to introduce tonight's speaker. Well, hi, everybody. Hi. I, I, am, I am so excited that we're doing this event here. Uh, I really am. I mean, we do a lot of events here, but it's been a long time. I mean, I haven't seen you all for, for a year and a half, and that's been a long year and a half. So hey, let's start off by giving ourselves applause, okay? All of us applause for this last, this last year and a half, and for coming out and not being afraid and for surviving this and learning all the little things we have to do to get around COVID, these rules. I mean, just taking my mask off to speak, I had to ask our HR director, is this okay? And he said, yes, it's okay if you're six feet away. I said, I assured him it's fine, so we can do that. And then we had to, like, not do the food that we all like, you know, because, you know, how do you, like, not cover up? And we just couldn't, we just fit. okay, we'll, we'll wait for the food. We promise you we'll bring back the coffee and the sweets you like. We promise. <laughs> we just couldn't quite do it. And then setting up for the event, it was like going to the vacation house you haven't been at for a year and a half. It's like, oh, yeah, what's that there? 
And then, of course, our ShowWorks folks, this was not simple getting this set up here because we're doing this online as well. We are streaming this live on YouTube. We're recording it. And that's why we have all this equipment around. And then some things didn't work and some cables didn't work because they hadn't been plugged in for a year and a half and so on and so forth. So, so it's all about getting back in the rhythm of things. But this is what we have to do. We've survived this long period of time. I do believe we're going to come out of it. And so you know, thank you all for your continued support and coming out um, to our events. Now, we do these events to really promote Hagley. That's really the purpose of it. Obviously, Hagley is doing it. And my job is to promote research in the collections. Uh, I kid and say I'm in academic marketing, and that's kind of what I do. And what we do with these author talks is bring to your attention scholarship that results in books that we feel can speak to a wider audience. And that's kind of a conversation what that means. And it's one of these things like you know the old saying that if you know what pornography is, if you see it. You, know, you kind of see the book, and you know that book is going to speak to a wider audience. And sometimes you see the book and you go, well, maybe not. Good book, but it's probably not going to have uh, that kind of reach. And that's what we're going to be doing again. We're going back to doing author talks twice in the fall, twice in the spring. We're going back to that schedule. We see in the back table, we're promoting the next one, which is by Eric Hintz, a book on independent inventors in the age of corporate R&D. Terrific book used in our collections. And we have plans for the spring, which I can't tell you yet because we haven't confirmed the speakers, but we will do these things in the spring. So these are back online for our kinds of events. Um, I'd also encourage you to check out some of the online activities we're doing. I mean, you know, COVID, you know, we learned a few things. Uh, we learned how to use this thing called Zoom. I never knew what Zoom was mm -hmm. until about March 27th in 2020. Like, oh, what's this thing Zoom? You know, so, and of course, you all figure it out. And we discovered we could do great things with this. So one thing that, that we developed uh, was a program called Hagley History Hangout which is interviews every two weeks with people who have used our collections, and sometimes books, sometimes ongoing researchers. Greg Hargraves in the back is really the one who created that program and, has, and drives it. He's, it's really his program. It's been fantastic, tremendous listenership. It's on our website, and you can listen to it in the comfort of your homes. Lots of interesting stuff. And if you find something which isn't that interesting, of course, you can just skip to the next one. Every two weeks, you can kind of check that out. And we're doing a conference in the fall. It's sort of an order of academic kind of conferences. You may or may not be interested. But again, we're going to try to start doing things in person as well as doing them online to take advantage of this new place we have where you can do more online. But also, there's nothing like having an event in person. There's really no substitute for that. So that's one reason I'm excited. We're doing this. We're doing a great program. The other reason is specific to Tina Manko giving this talk about a book. And I literally have been waiting for years for this moment. Um, yes, and, and I, I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative sense, you know, but, but her research, which you'll hear about, you know, began when I was still connected to the university developer, early, early on when I was a faculty member there. And the, and the stuff she has done on Avon, not only is it great, but it broke open research on Avon. And that's not often the case where someone does research and it opens the door. Everybody else who does research at Avon has read Tina's dissertation and has benefited from the work that, that she did. So by getting the records in the first place, which is Tina got the records for Hagley. Let's be clear about that. She's a grad student. She went up there. She figured out her way into the collection, found out they were throwing stuff out, got Hagley on board. Stuff came down. Then when she did that, we hired her to process the collection which is convenient if you're writing a dissertation on this, that you're hired to process the collection on which your dissertation is based. So it was very thing. But so, so this, is, this is, you know, but this is Tina, all right? I mean, you know, we have scholars who do great work, but not all these scholars know how to find their way into a corporate archive, talk to the corporate archive, and get them to give the corporate, ar corporate archive to the library that's near where she's going to graduate school. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, Tina, I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's a, that's, you've got a, she's a special skill uh, in this way. So I've wanted this kind of thing for a long time. I mean, when I started the author talks, honestly, it was this book that I had in mind as the example of the kind of book that I wanted to make possible for you all to hear about. Because I think this is the kind of excellent scholarship, interesting topic that I want people to know about. Um, now, Tina, I, we have a long history. Tina was wandered into my first, very first class in Delaware in 1991, labor history course there, which was a long time ago, okay? You, you can do the math, you're all smart people and all that. 
And then, of course, I moved to Hagley, and then we've had a long, we've lots of water under the bridge between, you know, Tina and I, various things, you know. And so we've known each other for a long time. She's been very active in the Business History Conference, an organization that I've been an administrator of there. She's served on committees. She's published articles and publications I've been connected with. So really, this has been going on for a long time. And then when she told me that she had a contract from Oxford to publish the book, I was about ready to jump up and down. You know, and all that, and I, and I just, you know, I mean, you, I've just been trying to help this along for a long time. So um, that's why I'm so excited. Not only in general they were able to do this, but that I can introduce to you Tina Manko, uh, who written the book about Avon and has really broken over and open research generally uh, about this important company and the things they've done. All right, I'm going to shut up. Tina, come on up there to give her a give her a hand. Hi. That was very, very kind. Thank you. Uh, Hagley is, um, is my academic home, without a, without a doubt. I was a Hagley fellow um, way, way a long time ago. Um, and uh, just as a, as a Hagley fellow and, and coming here, this, I, I thought it was this very podium that I did my very first uh, conference paper on. They assure me it's been updated, although. Anyway, um, <laughs> so it's still good, it's good, it's good. So, um, but I appreciate being here uh, uh, more than you know, and um, for, that, for that I'm happy. Uh, I am the Avon lady. I had the best research project of, for uh, historians. Oftentimes you ask historians, and, and what are you working on? And you, sometimes you gotta take a deep breath and kind of like there's, you know, people and events and things, and you go, oh, wow, yeah, it's really neat. But all I ever had to say was, I'm writing a book about Avon and Avon ladies. And everybody just went, oh, I know what that is. And, and it's like, and that was done. Um, and so that was, that was a lot of fun. And in that regard, I kind of want to know from you and where you are, um, people in the audience, is there anyone here that was an Avon lady or is an Avon lady? Oh, well, that's not, usually that's not quite what happens. How about, does anyone have a, a relative, a, a mom, a sister, an aunt, a, a really close friend? Oh, I see one, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> two, because <laughs> you're together. <laughs> um, or does anyone remember the Avon lady coming to their house? There we go, yeah. You know, if you ask that for the 30 and under crowd, and you say, I, I say I'm writing a book on Avon, they're like, what's, what's Avon? Uh, right, so, but that's all right. They use cosmetics that I've never heard of, and that's so it all comes comes around. But um, my introduction to Avon was probably very much like yours, with these little lipstick samples that my mother brought home uh, from work. Uh, Avon ladies who brought their catalogs uh, to the workplace and sent them home. But they had this whole little drawer full of of bullet shaped lipsticks and samples. But I wanted to start um, with, a, with a question that people often have about Avon and direct selling. So if you bear with me a minute here, I want to tell you what this industry is because it's so unique and there's a lot of misperceptions um, about it. So an Avon lady um, is technically an independent contractor. She does not work for Avon. She does not have to put in a certain number of hours. And this was true throughout the entire history of Avon and the California Perfume Company, which preceded it. Um, they act as business wholesalers, the company. So the company, the Avon company, when they sign up with an independent contractor, cannot require certain things from the Avon lady. And so what they do is they give a contract in which she is able to purchase at wholesale the product that she sells. So if I end up selling a $10 lipstick, I have purchased it from the company probably at a 40% discount. I've paid $6 for it. I sell it to you for 10 and I pocket that $4. Um, and so as an independent business owner, the Avon lady has certain, um, and any direct sales representative has uh, benefits that were going to come from having an independent business. And the biggest part of that, which you might be able to relate to, is they get to uh, file a Schedule C on their income taxes. Because everything that they're getting as an independent business owner um, that they have to pay for qualifies as a business expense. So those catalogs 
she paid for. Like she had to purchase them. All those little lipsticks she purchased from the company. Um, anything that she was handing out. And then on the Schedule C, depending on uh, the, the volume of her business, she is able to claim office space. Um, she can claim mileage for delivering product. If she ends up going to an annual conference or training seminars, uh, she can claim those expenses, hotel expenses, if you go to the Jamboree for three nights. Um, and so in that way, uh, the business is real. She has to incur some expense for it. Um, the Direct Selling Association uh, has a code of ethics uh, that surrounds direct selling um, that Avon was very much a part of, of writing. Um, and so it had included things about recruiting as well as the product guarantees that you got. So if you went to a party, if you went to, um, and you purchased, and because you know the person and you end up buying all this stuff, um, you know, you have a, a three-day guarantee to give it back and to get your money back if you purchase too much, for example. So there is a whole code of ethics around direct sales that makes it not a Ponzi scheme, which everyone says is, oh, it's going to be a Ponzi scheme. So again, let me just, this is so important to how the, to how the history of Avon plays out. I want to just tell you a little bit more about some of the terms you hear regarding direct selling. Um, oh, I got it right here. So in the first place is there's a relationship between the company and the re representative, right? That's the first one we'd have to look at. Avon was a dual marketing company. Um, there's not too many of them anymore. Uh, that means that there are two actors. There's the company who recruits the representative. And that representative purchases at wholesale and is paid a commission based on her personal sales. End of story. Dual marketing. Company recruits you. You get paid by your personal sales. The one that you hear about quite a bit is multi-level marketing. And this is the one that makes us all a little nervous. Multi-level marketing means that the representative is paid on a ladder of commissions. So the representative is usually recruited by another representative um, and then uh, is paid a commission on their personal sales. But the moment I, as a representative, can turn around and recruit someone else, um, so I turn around and Kim has been my customer and she loves the product and Kim, isn't this so great? Wouldn't you just like to get it at wholesale yourself? This is so easy. It's so fun. Just sign up. So Kim is now going to start selling these products and I'm going to start getting a little slice of her sales. Once I get three of them, once I get this whole front row going and they're having a good time, right? And then they start recruiting. That's called a downline and I'm a sales manager, and so I get a percentage of my personal sales. I need to keep selling because I need to keep recruiting people because people don't stay with it very long. Um, but then I can get their downline, and if they're really good and they get more people than I can get, and it gets into pretty exponential commissions for some people. Um, in the thousands, tens of thousands of dollars um, and upwards for a small group who is really good at this. So th this is what makes it go forever with the multi-level marketing. These are companies that was started by uh, Amway, the DeVos brothers in the 1940s or 50s um, uh, with the American Way Company. Uh, people ask, do you study American Way? I'm like, no, they scare me. Um, but they are really intent. Um, and they're the ones who got into a lot of trouble um, legally. Uh, and it did approach Ponzi schemes. The Amway, more recently Herbalife, um, right now LuLaRoe are multi-level marketing companies that kind of really push the edges of these. But um, other companies that do it, like Mary Kay Cosmetics, for example, uh, Pampered Chef, and others, uh, they're, more, they're very legitimate uh, companies. So that's dual marketing, multi-level marketing, is the relationship between the company and the representative. Next up is the relationship between the representative and the customer. And there's two forms of that. That's door-to-door -door sales. That's Avon, ding dong, right, where the representative goes to just one person at a time or one family at a time um, and does their sales pitch door-to-door. -door. The other innovation happens in the 1930s, and that's uh, the home party. 
Uh, that's where Kim, um, instead of just me selling to her, why don't you invite your sister? Why don't you invite a few friends? Maybe if we can get five, I'll give you a prize, right? We'll get, you want that lipstick? I'll give it to you for free if you bring me four more customers, right? And so she does, and then I make a huge show. It's like, Kim got this for free, right? And so then other people want to do it. So the home party is an economy of scale. Instead of just selling to one person, I can sell to four. But if you were Stanley Home Products, in the 1930s, that is a spin-off from an executive who was with the Fuller Brush Company, who uh, Frank Stanley Beverage made Stanley Home Products. Out of Stanley Home Products came some very famous people. Mary Kay Ash was a Stanley Home Products representative and started Mary Kay Cosmetics. Uh, Mary Crowley, also very successful, did home interiors and gifts. Um, and of course, uh, Brownie Wise, uh, the mastermind of the Tupperware home sales force, was a Stanley Home representative. And they all kind of um, perfect this home party as a way of selling. So those are the relationships. And I just want you to be um, aware of them, because that's what door-to-door -door sales and multi-level. Multi-level doesn't mean you sell to a lot of people. It means you recruit a lot of people. And then the home party um, companies, uh, that's what the vast majority of these are. There are hundreds if not thousands of these companies still um, who market in this way. So we're going to launch into Avon, which has a very long history. And my uh, interest in Avon was not just about the products. And in fact, I don't do very much with the products, the lipsticks, the lotions, the perfumes. It's not where my interest was. My interest was in the way that Avon related to those representatives, the way that Avon sold them a business and called them business women. You are in business for yourself. This is what you will do. And they are largely unsupervised, right? They're, there's a home office in New York, and these women are scattered across the country. Um, and it's, it's a multi billion dollar industry and billion dollar uh, sales uh, within, within Avon. Um, so we're looking at Avon service, Avon products, um, and Avon careers. Begins in 1886, which is quite a bit older than most people expect. And it begins as the California Perfume Company. And there's a lot of lore about how it becomes the California Perfume Company, that David McConnell uh, had been selling books door to door and had a representative, uh, Mrs. Persis Foster Eames Albee, up in Concord, New Hampshire, um, who was in her 50s. And to sell books, he started giving out um, perfume samples, little tiny perfume samples. And the story is that he, that these perfume samples become even more popular than the books, and they start producing perfumes in full sizes, and eventually this line turns over um, that becomes the California Perfume Company. Pictured here is the, uh, one of their first um, logos, uh, Chamber Street, uh, down in Chelsea, and then um, that is not the office, that is a picture of the Suffern manufacturing plant. The, all the manufacturing was done up in Suffern, New York, which is where the McConnell family was from. And then pictured, I had some other images of their color plate catalog in, the, in 1915. By 1905, they have 10,000 representatives uh, across the country. 10,000, this is not a little concern. Um, most of them are selling in very rural parts of the country. They are not selling in cities. They are selling in tiny little towns. Um, and uh, these, the innovation of 1915 um, for the color plate catalog, because the sample case with all of its products was getting too heavy. Um, and they create these beautiful, I should have grabbed one out of the archive. Um, uh, you know, they're quite large and they're gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous to show the products. And so this is what uh, the women would, would show in order to, to sell. My uh, interest was in them. And I have, uh, I have just an absolute love affair with some of these, some of these uh, women who were selling. They were intense, some of them at least, were intensely proud of what they were doing to dress up, to bring your sample case with you. Um, to have your photograph taken um, was a pride for a lot of women and they would write to the company and, and they would say so. Um, they are uh, a group of women that are managed remotely through correspondence. 
uh, a representative from the company had showed up one day at their door, had them sign a contract, but after that, they were told to build their business on their own. They got regular correspondence, newsletters, suggestions, um, and really tried to make an identification with the company through those uh, letters uh, about when to sell, how to sell, remember how to sell. And initially, McConnell was telling them that this was really just part and parcel of their domestic duties, right? That as a housewife, this is kind of what you do, and you got to arrange your work of your house in order that you can fit in four or five hours a week of selling these very useful products to, to your neighbors. And uh, they had a four-week selling campaign, so the first products, uh, the catalogs would come or the sales leaders would come. They were meant to canvas their neighborhood, uh, canvas their friends, um, take their orders, then mail that order into the company. It, the company would then get them and they'd mail all the orders back, and when you deliver them to collect the money, you're to take another order for the next for the next set, and you could keep. You're supposed to keep this uh, going. Most women did not do this. Um, most women <laughs> made very small sales. They are with the company for just a few months. But what they know is that the women who stay with California Perfume Company for at least a year. Are, can carry the vast majority of their sales. So efficiency-wise, um, it's astonishing to me that the company can make any money doing this because there is no efficiency in distributing products like five, five bottles of perfume and two bottles of lotion and five sets of, of toothpaste powder. And somehow, with all the shipping costs, that's supposed to work, and it, but, it, but it does. The group that I am most interested in were the women who did the recruiting, who found these women to sell in their hometowns. Um, what David McConnell does um, is to create a level of middle management that is open exclusively to women, um, and again, unsupervised, that they have enormous power within the company. So what you see here, well, I kind of mixed up one of the ones. The one on the, above me, the snowbird, that's actually of a representative. She took a picture of herself holding her catalog in the middle of the snow and off she was going. Um, she is not afraid to get out on a winter's day. Um, the other two ladies you see here, the general agents. General agents were women who worked as uh, representatives. Um, and we're at a point in their life where they could pack up and be on the road for anywhere from six to nine months of the year. Representatives as a whole tended to be married. They tended to have children. Um, and then the general agents have to have been either single, widowed, never married. Their children were grown. Many of them report that their husbands had died or their husbands had left that they were looking to do something. And so they sign on as a general agent. They agree to train. They head out into the countryside to recruit. But I just got to paint a little bit of a, of a picture here. Is that my same lady? No, nope, different lady, same pose. Um, I love this one in the middle. It was a mother-daughter team uh, who were selling. And traveler number one, Hattie Goss, showing, having her portrait showing her, her color plate catalog. Imagine this, though. Avon, or California perfume products are sold in towns of less than 2,000. The vast majority of those towns are less than 500 people. Tiny little crossroad towns. In Manhattan, in their offices, they have these maps of states and counties and their railroad lines. And they will put a woman onto a train and they will follow that train along. They will find every stop on that train. They will check it against the census record of how big that town is. Circle Montana, uh, 700 people, 120 families. Uh, to stop there and the woman is meant to recruit there. What the company has to do, and we're talking 1910-ish, right? Put yourself back there. They have to know where that woman is heading, know the railroad line. They have to work 10 days ahead, guessing where she is going to be on her route. From Manhattan, they mail a trunk with 10 
recruiting packets, an envelope with a contract, some sales brochures, the little sample case, and a color plate catalog. She gets 10 of these at a time because they're too heavy otherwise. So she has to go along. She gets to her train station. Say she's out of catalogs. She has to get there, look for the box, right? She has to get the delivery of her catalog. She has to find a hotel or a boarding house or somewhere to stay. And then she gets her situation reports, 10 at a time, town by town by town, the size of the town, if there was a representative there before, how much business that representative did, if the representative owes them any money, because sometimes she had to go and collect some money, but if they didn't, she could just ignore it. And then find someone to recruit. I mean, to, uh, to yes, to recruit, to sell. And to sell, she has to both sell them, but she has to find someone who they feel knows the town, can start selling, has the ambition. A $5 deposit for the sample case and the book and the contract. That's where they said the husbands sometimes stepped in and messed everything up because they would have a good thing, but women don't have bank accounts, right? And they don't necessarily have access to that $5,000. And so they would say, ah, oh, you know, they were like kind of railing against husbands who had a great recruit and then he won't let his wife do it. Um, but then she found they would find other men and they'd be, oh, may, you know, may their numbers increase, these, these, um, these men who, who understand the value of a good business. But this is just so remarkable to me that this company could track a hundred of these agents going across the country. Where are you going to be? You got to get that stuff in the mail at the right time to have it delivered that she can have it. Um, not pictured here. I wish I had pictures of my two most favorite traveling agents. Leela Eastman was traveling uh, California up through Oregon and Washington and then uh, uh, Wyoming and down, in Montana and Wyoming and down through the Rocky Mountains. She was working in San Francisco as a dental assistant, making $10 a month. She said she was vulcanizing teeth. I don't even know what that means. She, <laughs> she learned about Avon. She had been selling real silk hosiery um, and she wanted something better. So she gets the contract to sell California Perfume Company um, products and to recruit. She is trained, and off she goes on, and she is a dynamo. She earns, this was um, 1928. She's earning $100 a month. That's your base salary. From $10 a month, vulcanizing teeth, to $100 a month. She gets a dollar uh, bonus for every recruit that she gets. So the goal was to get 20, 25 a month, so there's another 20, 25 dollars. Of those new recruits, if their first order was at least $30 wholesale, there was another $3 bonus. So she is doing this, and she's making, and then next thing you know, like within a year, her base salary is up to $140 a month, and she still keeps getting all of these bonuses. She found herself up in Walla Walla, um, Oregon, Washington, or they thank you, Walla Walla. She called it a hickey hickey town, Walla Walla. Um, and she had run out of cases, she'd run out of her stuff, and then the next train wasn't leaving till Monday. And she couldn't believe she was losing three whole days, right? This was money that she had to do, um, and she couldn't do it. So she bought herself a little Ford coupe. Um, wasn't going to be reliant on the railroad anymore, and she painted little Cupid dolls on it, she said. Um, and she took off into Wyoming and Montana into these tiny little towns and she recruited women and I can follow, there's so few of women that you can follow the actual numbers. Um, they did, they were putting in those $30 orders. Henley Bachler back in uh, New York learned she was in a car. Who told you you could buy a car? He says he realized later she should have just told him to mind her own business, that she was doing quite well. It was Leela Eastman who was asked to found one of the first city sales offices um, in Pasadena, California. I'll get to her in a minute. Um, let me see what my next image is. Oh, Elizabeth Butts. I wish I knew more about her. Is that woman proud of her work? Or what, the feather boa, the leather driving gloves, the desk writing her contract. I mean, when you think of women in business, I don't know, I, don't, I, I remember seeing these images the first time and just being astonished um, by them. Uh, 
The other woman I wanted to tell you about was Louise Fogarty. Louise Fogarty, oh, Leela Eastman, by the way, had two daughters that she left with her mother in San Francisco when she went on her trip. Uh, Louise Fogarty was young, unmarried, had no children. From what I can tell, she never did uh, marry. She, too, uh, was on a... Uh, on a route that took her down through, eventually through Georgia um, and, this, and the American South. Um, she describes in her diary, she calls it my adventure alone. She was so thrilled to get out. Uh, she's the one who told me that the company, when uh, the expenses of the company for the, for the traveling agents, that they had to pay for their own hotel um, and their own meals and any bus service or any other local transportation. The company paid only for the train. Um, and so she tried to keep her expenses under a dollar a day uh, for her hotel and, and her meals. Um, yeah, the company said that they only gave them dinner, they paid for their dinner on Thanksgiving and Christmas Day if they were still on the road. <laughs> so there's that. Um, all right, I'll leave, I'll leave her for, for a minute here. Let me just check where we are. All right, moving forward. So Leela Eastman um, is out and about in California. All these women are out, and the, the, these tiny little towns are... Uh, is where the California Perfume Company is. Always behind the time, always, Avon, is always five years late to the party. They finally open up uh, business in cosmetics. Uh, they had some lines of some lipsticks, um, but really introduced this Avon brand of cosmetic in 1928. And then the trademark that you see on the left, on the your left is uh, the first Avon logo that was modeled on the Anne Hathaway house because David McConnell thought that his house in Suffern looked like Stratford upon Avon or something like that. Um, 1928, 1929. When the Depression hits um, and starts to hit hard, Avon, California perfume company, Avon, every direct sales company, their profits go up. They do not lose sales. People who need something to do, I'll show you what's happening during the pandemic with, with direct selling. Um, people need something to do working from home and they just need little bits of money. They also find that people who are very poor and who are trying to save, they do like to splurge on a little bit of lipstick now and then. And so they were able to keep these uh, sales going. And so Avon during the 1930s, their sales and their profits go up every single year throughout the, throughout the 1930s. They, uh, they uh, innovate in a couple of important ways. One is they start national advertising in 1936 uh, with the Avon brand, first time that they've tried a national advertising. The second thing that's super important is that they, sorry about that, um, I try not to say super important, um, city sales. All this time they had been rural and were afraid of cities and didn't want to work into, into cities and so they start to try to think about how do we organize a city market. Uh, it should go without, it should not go without saying. This is, for the, for the most part, this is a very white company. These are very white uh, representatives. For the first time when they're talking about city markets, they start to mention a few of the African American representatives that are within the, uh, within the company. But when it comes to cities, they start to say very explicitly about not recruiting uh, in, in African American neighborhoods. They also have a couple of other policies that prevent or met, make it very difficult. Um, African American representatives are not able to send in their wholesale order without full payment. So African American customers could not just give an, an order and pay for it when it came. They had to pay for it up front. They said there's a few good neighborhoods out there, so see what you can do. But they were really trying to avoid uh, cities, both because for the, for, of the working poor, um, African Americans. The, you know, this, this is a time, especially as, as World War II is coming, when the cities are starting to empty out into the suburbs, leaving um, in the inner cities uh, a, a demographic that is much browner and, and, and more immigrant-based. And so it's selling this, uh, this now you are in business for yourself is very much part of a white middle class uh, ideology. Let me go back a little bit, World War II. World War II comes, and the company is poised 
to go into these city markets. Um, but Avon ends up going a different route. They drop from 35,000 representatives nationwide to about 25,000 nationwide by 1943. Women are moving into uh, lucrative war work, uh, but they retain a very powerful core of representatives. And those 25,000 representatives outsold any other uh, cohort of representatives from any year before it or after. They were very committed to it. Avon gets into war contracts. They convert a lot of their plants. They had just started, they were beginning to build a new lipstick manufacturing plant up in Rye, uh, New York, it's a more New York City based there. Um, they sell little dat packs uh, for soldiers, deodorant, shampoo, toothpaste, powders. They developed a special powder for pilots with their masks to put on before they put their masks on. And they made an awful lot of money through the war contracts. So when they came back from World War II, the men of Avon, and they have these conferences for the men of Avon, aren't they gorgeous? So, and in the center there, in the back under the chandelier is their um, CEO, uh, John Ewald. He was the third CEO of the company. It went from David McConnell to David McConnell Jr., who in 1944 dies suddenly of a heart attack. Um, and so suddenly, after 70 years, the company is now out of the family um, and handed over to John Ewald. They had to decide what to do uh, about the attitudes within the company about sales by women. They had their strong cohort of women. They had all this money from the war contracts. They're building a brand new lipstick plant. And the guys are like, ah, oh, this is getting too hard. They had to recommit back to a cohort of representatives that had very small sales. They called her Little Mrs. Smith. We have to cater to Little Mrs. Smith. We have to make her feel very important. And we have to have products and other things that's going to make her want to come back to this company. And so in those moments, in those years, they had the option, I think, to give up direct selling and, and make Avon into a more commercial retail corporation. But they decide to recommit wholesale to, uh, to direct selling. And that's where most people think of Avon, right, of the suburban, uh, culture and the and the more famous campaigns uh, that come out. 19. It's not going to be till 1956, but I have it here. It's the very first Ding Dong, uh, Avon calling commercial. Um, it's a bit of an infomercial. It, when you watch it, really think of that. It's really aimed at the consumer of trying to teach the consumer of what's supposed to happen. Let's see if this works. I got to get through the. Hang on. Big. This year, I yeah, I don't want him. Hang on. <laughs> but shoulder. Yeah, he's not what I want. There we go. Oh, didn't have the doorbell yet. Hello, I'm your Avon representative. I'm here to show you Avon's fine cosmetics and toiletry. Thank you for inviting me in. First, here's Avon's wonderful Color Last lipstick. It lasts for hours, but never dries the lips. It comes in 12 very flattering shades, colors that are right for your complexion and costumes. And each has its harmonizing rouge and Avon nail polish, an Avon face powder in many luscious, natural-looking shades. And then you can choose from Avon's many creams, lotions, and delightful fragrances. All Avon products are the finest quality and moderate in price. Welcome your Avon representative when she calls. If no representative is calling on you, look up the Avon office in your phone book and ask for service. All right, Avon. Box T, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, New York 20, New York. <laughs> Isn't that great? I heard words like luscious and creams and lotions could sound so inviting. Let me show you one more because we're, we're, we're good on time here. You want to see the next one where they put in the, the doorbell? You probably noticed that oh. we didn't even have our famous doorbell there. Yeah, okay. That came along in 1956 with our first jingle. Avon calling. Take time out for beauty when Avon comes calling. Use Avon Cosmetics and you'll be enthralling. For a pleasure-filled break in your daily routine, it's time to take time out for beauty. Avon calling. 
Ouais. <rire> That's on the Hagley Archive digital site. You can watch the whole thing. I have 56 here. I was, is that what they said? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so you notice there you have both the representative and the, and the consumer. Um, what the city markets do and what the national advertising campaigns do and then this television advertising campaign is to increase the, the sheer numbers of Avon representatives uh, and its sales. Coming out of uh, World War II, Avon is going to grow exponentially. I wrote it down a little somewhere. Ugh. Um, there are over 100,000 uh, Avon representatives by 1955, figuring that they left World War II with 25,000. Um, that's an enormous increase um, in, in the sheer numbers of, of women who are selling. Women who had left the lucrative war industries market, um, labor force, and were looking for something to do. Uh, new suburban neighborhoods, direct sales, home parties, door-to-door -door sales was a good way to get to know your neighbors if you had just moved into a new place. Um, and Avon continues to sell, not just the product. You notice that second commercial is very much showing the products and trying to get you interested in that. Um, but they continue to sell very hard this notion of a career for women. And they start using a career. They have always said a business for yourself, but now they're wanting women to think of themselves um, as having a career. You'll see the same model, who was in the second one, Connie Johannes, is going to be the model in all of Ava, Avon advertising until like 1967. Um, it's one of the longest running uh, ad campaigns, and she's one of the longest running spokespeople. Um, I love this image of uh, Avon Outlook, which was a uh, publication for representatives. Uh, she's standing there at the corner of Prize and Earnings Street. And notice she's looking back over her shoulder at her kids, who are in the house waving goodbye. One of the things I've always noticed with um, Avon, oh, this one doesn't show it, is um, Avon, when they drew children, the daughter is always older. The daughter is always taller if there's a little, you know, not like the street signs for the schools where there's the little boy protecting the little girl to get her across. And it's always in Avon literature, it's always the daughters who are highlighted. Um, and there is a lot of things like this you know, of money, that what, what you need is cash. Uh, and so these beautiful manicured hands holding these coins that kind of float out, asking women to imagine their homes, uh, their new refrigerator, their college education for their kids, new clothes, vacations. That's what Avon was meant to open up for you. Um, I will go back and suggest, again, most women don't do this. Right? It's, it's, uh, you're with Avon for a couple of months. Women mostly recruited in. The biggest numbers always came in October because they want money for Christmas um, presents and things. Um, and then they leave. The average Avon lady stays with the company only a few months. Uh, only about less than 10% of Avon representatives stay more than a year. But those representatives who stay for a year make up the bulk of the sales. Uh, for the for the company, there's more of Con Connie jo Johannes. I'm your Avon representative. I bring you fragrance news. The purple gloves, the little purple uh, handkerchief, the, the hair, everything. I love these. They're so thing. So, 1950s, Avon is growing and growing. Always behind the times, they have yet to figure out there's a teenage market. They do not figure that out until the night, late 1960s. They start marketing to teenagers. Um, and they come in late to other movements as well. Um, the feminist movement is decades ahead for them. Civil rights, civil rights movement uh, does pique their interest and by the 19, early 1970s, early 1960s, Avon starts changing its policies and this is both within its representative sales force of trying to uh, consciously reach out into more African American neighborhoods and families and groups. Um, but also internally within the company. This is a major manufacturing company that does all of its own products in uh, 
uh, out in Morton Grove, uh, Chicago, Rye, Suffern, uh, Davenport, Iowa, where they're, and, and all, they start paying very close attention to who they're hiring within the manufacturing uh, plants. They start thinking a little bit about promotions uh, into middle management. Uh, but they work pretty hard with some, with some civil rights groups um, to open up more of the corporate opportunities. Um, they hire Uniworld uh, to do advertising uh, within the African American market. The one that they're closest to, though, is the consumer rights markets. Um, and that's where they start to be more uh, a leader in the direct sales association about ethics within direct selling. Uh, 1964, I think, is the furnace, uh, Holland furnace case of uh, direct sellers who were selling furnaces door to door. Um, and they had several cases of elderly single women who they sold these fabulously expensive furnaces to who they then can't pay for them. Um, and this becomes a case um, about uh, the ethics of direct sales. And Avon's a, is, is a leader there. Um, and so that through the 1970s, when they start, eventually start paying attention to the women's groups as well, this is a picture of the corporate board. Um, I'm going to say 1978. 1972, they, hired, they appointed to the corporate board Dr. Cecily Selby. She is uh, standing in the middle. A woman that you can, a white woman that you can see standing in the middle. She had been a CEO. She had been running the Girl Scouts um, Association, and I think they kind of thought that the Girl Scouts and their cookie sellers was a little bit like Avon, and they went for Cecily Selby. What they did not know um, was that she was a dermatologist and worked for Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and had a scientific background. As well, they learned that after the fact um, that they hire her in as uh, on the corporate board. She had also been part of the corporate board of um, RCA uh, Televisions. Um, then one year later, they hire, they uh, name Ernesta Procope, and she is the African American woman that you can see seated by the lamp. Uh, Ernesta Procope. Uh, owned the largest African-American life insurance company uh, in the United States. Her husband was the owner of the Amsterdam News, the African-American newspaper out of Brooklyn. Um, and together, these two women are kind of propped up as evidence of Avon's uh, attempt to become more diverse, to become more inclusive for women. Um, on the ground level, more women are moving into management. But that path to middle management that were created by those traveling agents means that most women in management are working in city offices. They are in the suburbs. Um, no one ever comes to see them very much. They hire their own assistants. Uh, they recruit, they train, they hold Monday morning sales meetings. Um, and they can become pretty important uh, as, as managers, but they are not within the corporation. All those little city sales offices um, are run by women and women assistant managers, but it's not at all the same path as to women in management within New York City. By the 1980s, uh, Avon has discovered the women's movement, um, and they are all in. They start this new uh, campaign for uh, recruiting uh, women of of a very diverse uh, background. They try to uh, tout the business as something that can uplift women who need economic support. Uh, where was I? Um, it's in the 1980s that we have a conversation, a national conversation that's very much um, includes the phrases of like, you can have it all, for example, or the superwoman. Right, the superwoman who's working at home and working her business and can do it all and you can have it all. And they'd really try to explore this. In the meanwhile, their corporate board stays at Cecily Selby and uh, Ernesta Procope. 
Their higher up, their C-suite, their, their corporate executive suite stays almost all male. Uh, through the 1990s, they start to hire women in, uh, name women as presidents of different divisions. The uh, North American division was headed by Christina Gold, for example. Um, Andrea Young, who's uh, Canadian, uh, will also come in through uh, Avon's North American group. I've left out through all of this and on purpose Avon's international reach. Other scholars have done that and that like changes the story um, wholly. It's not until 2000 or 1999 that Andrea Young was finally named CEO of a company that said it would be the company for women. Here she's pictured with um, Susan McCoy, uh, who will be uh, next in line uh, uh, for Avon. Um, this was a big deal. That's when I started to go up there in the 1990s, and I started to spend time at Avon. It was a time when Christina Gold, for example, uh, was really thought that she would be the next CEO. And in 1997, when they passed over her, uh, to give the leadership of, of Avon to, what was his name, Charlie, I'm gonna, I lost it there, sorry, I'm working without notes. Um, Charlie, he ha had been head of Duracell batteries. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um, and they passed over Christina Gold. Christina Gold left Avon um, and went to work as the CEO of Excel Communications, which was a direct sales company that sold long distance service door to door. My mother did that for a month. Um, <laughs> Um, and so this was, a, this was a big deal, and this is actually when I started to go up to Avon. The 1990s represented a point where Avon's trajectory on this kind of world map, this ever upward trajectory of this company, started to show signs of, of sputtering. 1990s, Avon reached out into other, and made itself a conglomerate. It bought Mallinckrodt uh, healthcare systems, it bought a line of nursing homes, it brought, uh, bought Giorgio per perfumes, um, I've got to say Tiffany, can that be right? They had a jewelry company that was pretty big. Point is, they dispersed their, their profits and they started to lose a lot of money. Andrew Young came in with the intention of taking Avon out of this old-fashioned kind of uh, sales format. In fact, when the Avon archive came here, um, you know, I'd been up there, it's in the back of their mail room, all these boxes. I said to Michael Nash, who was, he was here, and I said, you, I said, the love of trade catalogs, I said, for the love of trade catalogs, you have to have this collection because it's complete and it's awesome and it's gorgeous. And it came down and we finally got it here and we're starting to deal with it. And um, Avon, uh, please come for the opening of the archive. And we had this beautiful reception up at the Soda House and uh, Susan McCoy and Christina Gold had come down um, you know, for this little press event that the Avon Archive is now here. And we put up those beautiful posters of the, of the 1950s. And um, I said the words ding dong, and all of them were like, oh, jeez. <laughs> like, please. <laughs> they were working so hard to get rid of ding dong. And they didn't want it anymore. And they didn't want all those ads. They wanted to be modern, and they wanted to be chic. And they kept saying ding dong, and they didn't like it. Um, and <laughs> So, <laughs> Andrew Young was supposed to make it chic. She was supposed to have brought in this really kind of high-end glamour into uh, the company, and it didn't quite work. She had two major downfalls. Uh, one was a bribery case that came out of China that cost the company over $500 million uh, to litigate. That didn't go so well. The second thing that I think did her in was the internet. They were unable to keep up with the internet of women who they were so committed to, to uh, selling, to building a business, to that whole uh, language of uplift of what you can do and how legitimate this business is, not just working, really working, right? Um, that you could make this into something. And that internet kind of just changed everything about how people shopped and how you could even find 
um, a representative. Um, and they just kept losing more and more market share. Um, Andrea Young left the company, I think, in 2012 or 14, um, and it went through a series. Um, and then Avon actually isn't even, the Avon USA isn't even owned by Avon anymore. It became a company based in London, um, and Avon, uh, New Avon it's called, that handles North America split off and is, a, is actually now a wholly different company. If you go online to buy Avon, you can like pick out your thing, pick out your little cream, and it's $40 for the little pot if you want it to be shipped from Avon. But then there's this little display of pictures of Avon ladies, and you can pick one of them that lives near you, and she'll deliver it to you, and lo and behold, the price drops about 40%. So they still want you to be able to, they're still dedicated to direct sales, um, but they're still in that dual marketing system. They have added some multi-level marketing to try to get some people that have a little more income. Uh, but it's, it's right now, it's, they're still trying very hard to figure out how to keep it. Um, and so there was Avon, the, the company for women. I think, um, I think my takeaway, uh, on the company is that it's worth paying attention to this very long history of a corporation that had dedicated itself to selling business and to treating women as legitimate business owners, um, both within the company and even inadvertent as it was to create a middle management line for them. Um, within the company itself, more women were employed by Avon uh, than any other uh, corporation at those ranks. Um, it consistently made the Working Woman magazine top 10 corporations for women to work for. They had um, paid close attention to needs for childcare, for flex time, for work sharing. And they were doing that in the 1990s because they were trying very hard to listen uh, to the needs of women um, in business. I think my last slide here because of the pandemic. Um, I saw this, does anyone want to take a guess on the year? <laughs> Can you see it? I started selling Avon because a regular office doesn't come with crayons. Any guesses? 2002. 2002. Felt like it could have been last year, doesn't it? Or this year. Before I go, I want you to do one last thing with you. This is from the Direct Selling Association Industry Statistics for 2020. Uh, direct, sale, direct retail sales, we'll just go from 2018, look what happens in 2020. Hey, thank you. 14% um, increase in direct sales in 2020, again, because direct selling tends to make it through um, uh, crisis times by building their businesses because it's reaching to people who are looking for. The number of direct sellers, this is um, within the United States, 7.7 .7 million, <laughs> one, of, one million of which are full-time, which they put at 30 hours a week, and the rest are under 30 hours a week. Sales by product category right now, the highest categories are in wellness, uh, vitamins and supplements and things like that. Um, and the demographics remain the same. 75% are women, 25% are men, who tend to be older, tend to be married uh, and with children. For the state by state, this is where the concentrations are. California, Texas, New York, um, Florida, the old Midwest here is um, still a hotbed for, for direct selling. So that's where it is today. This has not gone away. Um, and it continues to be an industry that um, attracts women to its ranks. Thank you.
Okay, this is a, oh, I'm sorry, a quick one. Who has it? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are. What ha, was when you were talking about what the buy-in was, at one point you said $5, another oh. time 5000 which is it? I did? Yes. Oh, I didn't mean that. I meant five. Five dollars. That was early. Right now you can join for free. I saw that. Um, even later, it never goes up very high, even before the pandemic when they're now trying to give this away. It's, it's not much over 40 or $50 to, to start up with a contract. I'm sorry about the 5000 I lost my mind. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk and congratulations on this book because I do think it has broad appeal and you know, expanding local history. I wonder, could you tell us more about the Newark branch and oh. was that a di what did they do there was that distribution that's and, distribution and was that a gateway to your discovering this oh. topic and going to New York only only in the sense that I drove by it every day um, and it was actually a friend of mine who when I was looking for a, for a topic said what about all those Avon ladies and actually I was going to I wanted to do something that was about Avon ladies and fuller brush men I wanted the balance. The Fuller Brush archives are gone, literally burned, gone. Um, so I had to stick with Avon. But that was a state-of-the-art distribution plant that was fully automated, in the, considered fully automated, I think, for the 1970s. So the orders would come in, and it was all these little trolleys and automatics, you know, the bins of all the different colors. And they could put the, uh, the orders in, and they would automatically uh, you know, drop into the boxes for each individual representative's order, um, and then they would be packed up and shipped out of that, out of the Newark plant. But yes, a lot of people say, oh, it was headquartered here in Newark. It's like, yeah, not quite, but yes, it's a distribution plant. It was a distribution plant. Who? Okay. Hi, Tina. Hi, Gary. Um, <laughs> as you know, I read an early draft of this book. Oh, no. uh, I won't explain to everybody how I was able to do that, but it, it's a long personal history. I was begging people. Yes. Uh, and the early draft I found very interesting in another way, which is that it was a lot about the individuals. Mm. Uh, you did read about Lila Eastman. You right. did read about some of these other people. And I got the impression from reading the finished book, which, by the way, is brilliant and should get the Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> that the reason you didn't go into that more is that there just wasn't a whole lot of information available about these individual Avon ladies. Thank you. Yes. That, is that your question? Yeah, well, I was just saying, you know, you also mentioned that other people can be doing research in this field, mm -hmm. and I wonder if there is anything out there they could do. The early... There's, there are a lot of individuals mentioned that I could find. I did a lot of census research from the 1910s, from the publications of the 1910s and 20s, to find, try to find these women. Um, and I was able to find a lot of them. It's very difficult. It was at the time, probably now. I haven't even tried. Uh, you had to go to the sound decks. You had to kind of at least know their, their hometown. Um, but if you didn't know a husband's name, it's very hard to find a woman in the census through that, through that old method. Um, and so the other thing that changes is the company stops printing the hometowns of representatives that they give prizes to because their publications are filled with lists and lists and lists of names. But without a town, um, it's just impossible to find them. I think for the 1970s and 80s, it's an oral history project. Um, it's just, it's so easy to start to come up with names of people who worked for Avon and to try to get at the, that, those personal stories that way. Um, that's, that's just out of the scope of what I can do or afford. Um, it's expensive and hard and it requires enormous planning to do a, a good oral history project, but I certainly hope someone does it for the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, but it's mostly by the company that I lose the individual stories. Um, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I, it's, it's funny, right, because you've got these corporate centers and then you've got these representatives out in the world and it's like the product leaves your hands and, you know, what happens to your brand image after that, uh, I guess, is sort of, uh, you know, up to them. Yes. But I was curious, what were some of the efforts that the company made to sort of manage their brand image, you know, at the point of like, you know, the product's out of their hands? Uh, great question. Um, the 1960s, they start paying for that kind of research. Um, 
And they try to manage it through, through the national advertising campaigns. The Ding Dong Avon commercial is ubiquitous. Um, and they have, the part, biggest part of the brand is the service, right? Is the Avon lady who's going to come to you and help you um, and make it for your family. Um, women were taught to kind of keep notes on all of their customers of how many people in their family, what, you know, how old are the kids, so that next time they can suggest more. Um, but Avon spends very little on advertising. That's where it can save a lot of money. Retail established cosmetics companies were spending 20, 30 percent of uh, of revenue on advertising. Their advertising budgets were huge. Avon's advertising budget was less than 3%. Um, they had a fraction of it. Um, and so the Avon brand, they rely on the representative. Inside the company, when they're doing uh, catalogs and uh, the representative training manuals, um, I, I'm trying to remember her name who, uh, who talked about it. She said they're forever astonished that Avon ladies know nothing about the products. <laughs> like they go and interview them and they're like, and how does this cream work and when are you supposed to use it? And they're like, I don't know, but I like this color. <laughs> and so they were forever trying to train the representatives who, you know, they're there for the Monday morning sales meeting for, you know, for the collegiality and the cookies and <laughs> where are our cookies? And um, so... Yeah, I, I, they didn't have as much, I, I think they're just really relying on a very old reputation for, for quality, um, and they just let it go, yeah. Hi, Tina. Hi, I'm, Katie. I'm going to ask you the question about the book you didn't write. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was interested, um, when you're talking in the early 20th century about, um, I think, the a California perfume company, um, and they're sort of... Um, cautious embrace of, of black sales or sort of arm's length um, yeah. embrace. Um, and I wondered how the, this direct sales method and the Stanley, you know, sort of um, template relates to um, black, you know, direct sales like Madame Walker and Poro, um, you know, because that's going on in, in the black, you know, cosmetics market. Yeah. Um, and Annie Turnbow Malone and um, Madame C.J. Walker are in that same... Uh, group of the, in the early 20th century of having uh, created a product, um, created a brand, and are selling it locally and to their friends. And Turnbow Malone also does, or is it Walker, who does the hair salons um, and sells it both as the whole service of, of hair care along with uh, the products. Um, they too have that kind of progressive era language of uplift and uh, community uplift that uh, for African American women and their families that uh, this is a business that's not just about you, it's about um, a community and to reach out to other women to give them the opportunity uh, to sell and to, and to own a business. Um, I don't ever have the sense that Avon knows about them. Um, they're just off their radar. Uh, for the most part. I wish I could include more. It, it's just simply not part of the archive of where I can even find um, information that would not be wholly speculative about what Avon was doing or thinking um, uh, in those markets. Uh, direct sales companies, there's thousands of them. And so the African-American companies, you know, the other one that's uh, really large, I don't know, uh, is a uh, insurance company. Um, selling, kind of, uh, kind of recruiting, it's more franchise, not, not so much direct sales, but another African-American insurance company um, at that time period doing the same thing of, of reaching out and trying to, to recruit. Any more questions? I don't have a question, but my friend Google said, yes, Avon bought Tiffany's. Oh, I was right. I was right. In 1978. I was right. I knew. <laughs> Thank you. Can you comment on the Avon bottle as a collectible? Oh, gosh. There was this horrible period in the 1960s and 70s where they started to do those collectioned bottles. Do I have a couple? I didn't want to do them. Let me see if I have it here. I'll show you. I, this is, it's an incomplete slide, but just to uh, remind you of all those <laughs> little uh, bottles. 
um, soaps on a rope and uh, decanters. They're geared towards kids. It was try an effort to uh, uh, incorporate children into, into the sales experience. Um, and in the 1970s is when, as part of this decanter series, also created the, per the, the Mrs. Albie Award. Um, they put her in this big flouncy Victorian dress that there's no way she wore. Um, and the Albie Award to the representative with the highest sales or something like that. And so these collector's items do become, they, people start collecting them thinking that they're going to be very valuable. The Bud Hastings catalog of every single bottle product that Avon ever made cross-referenced to the catalog. Um, and they became very hot items, certainly. When I started the pro project, I, my parents are, are antique collectors. I mean, it's just kind of what they do. You're the one, you know, they get obsessed with something. And I said, do not, under any circumstances, start buying these things for me. I am uninterested. Um, collections like that, like baseball cards, also destroyed by eBay. I mean, now they're, you can't give them away um, because so many people had them. What's that? Very little. Some of the old things, if they're um, you know, perfect in the case, and undented, but yeah, the perfume bottles that have been opened and these little things, no. Um, not, nothing there anymore. We have one more question here. Uh, two more, okay? Then we'll be done. How did the company recruit representatives? What qualities of women and saleswomen were they looking for? And how did the traveling representatives go about finding uh, a woman to be a representative? So initially they want women who have a reputation within, a solid reputation within their, within their communities. In practice, the, rep, the traveling agent got off the train and tried to find a boarding house and then asked the boarding house keeper if she knew anyone who might want to sell. They said they really hit gold when the boarding house keeper themselves agreed to sell because then they were done and could move on. Um, they were looking for married women. They're looking for older women. Uh, they're looking for married women. Um, and after that, it's really just a matter, I don't want to say it's to, to the point of, you know, do you have a pulse? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, anyone who says they will, they would try to uh, accompany. They would always offer, if you want, I'll go to this first sales meeting with you. Let's go talk to your neighbor, and I'll, and I'll show you how to do it. And then we'll go to one more, and you can try it yourself and see, isn't this fun? Now, do you promise, do you promise by the end of this week that you will have approached eight more customers? And they do what you're doing. Yep, 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 yep. I got it, I got it. Um, and they... That was about it, but they did want someone who was a little more uh, central in a town, these rural towns that are you know, sprawled out. Um, I think there's a reason why I see a lot of representatives on bicycles um, trying to get from place to place. Women also um, who were connected to churches, they tried to get women who were not part of soap clubs, the Larkin Soap Club, Larkin uh, out of Buffalo, beautiful uh, corporate Frank Lloyd Wright building. Um, it would reach out and you want, you need soap, you'll be part of a soap club, you get 10, 20 people to buy soap, we put in one wholesale order, we all got soap. Um, and so they tried to not compete with that or at least try to shoo out the, the Larkin people from a small town if they could. But um, I, I don't ever have the sense that there's a really high standard beyond a woman who says she wants to do it. Um, and then it's just correspondence, because they'll never see that traveling agent again. So it's just all correspondence um, to keep her going, to remind her. Uh, there's sales leaders, there's lots of sa sales contests. I didn't include the famous picture of how much naphtha soap, laundry soap can you sell in three months. They won a car. They gave away a little Ford rush, brush runabout, two of them. Um, for, for sales, and a woman in Stanton, Oregon, with a population of 900 people, won it. <laughs> so, so there you go. But, they, but lots of, I, what I didn't include, I know there's a little page in the book, there's um, 
every month, if, once you got your sales up, there was really gorgeous prizes uh, for you, percolators, serving dishes, jewelry, uh, watches, uh, you name it, that you could choose from a prize catalog based on your level of sales. So that also helped to, to keep people motivated. Oh. When did Mary Kay Cosmetics come into play and what kind of impact did that have on Avon and how did they? Ah, uh, good question. 1963. Uh, I love Mary Kay. I admit it. Um, <laughs> she's just, she is like the drag queen of American business. She uh, was, I mean, she was blonde. I mean, she wasn't a little blonde. She was blonde and she was about four foot ten and, um, she was powerful, uh, and she came out of Stanley Home Products and then the World Gift Corporation, and she was one of those city regional managers. Um, classic case of uh, training male managers, sales managers, and coming to work and finding her whole unit was turned over to them that they needed her to go and do something else. So she left that corporation um, and famously, you know, decided to pour her $5,000 of savings into starting Mary Kay. Um, she, her husband died at the breakfast table the day that she launched. It was her fourth husband. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, that's not, uh, but... Um, Anyway, so 1963, and she starts very slow, um, but she's doing home parties. Um, she reaches, she's in Texas, right? She's in Dallas, Texas, and she's really the, like, do you have a pulse? You're ready for this. So um, she, she's over the border really quickly, and some of her top sales at, uh, people early on are these Latina women working on the border of Texas and Mexico, and her, her goal is to get women out of corporations. She tells them throughout the 1970s, there is nothing there for you. They don't want you. Stop wasting your time and your talent. You come with me. Well, so anyone who believes money can't buy you happiness ain't been shopping with me, she would say. So um, initially, it's not a big deal. And Avon kind of scoffs at it. She's small. Um, her sales are nowhere near them. They are a worldwide corporation in over 100 countries and you know, they're in the billion dollars, they're in the fortune, I'd say they're in the fortune 500, but they corrected me, we're in the fortune 250, thank you. Um, so they don't mind her. 1990s though, she keeps going, that charismatic capitalism. Um, Avon thinks it's a joke, and Avon wants to tell women, if you don't want to get involved with all that Mary Kay, you know, Hoopla, you come with us. We're sane. We're easy. I'm serious. We're sane. You sell to your friends and neighbors. It's fun. You don't have to recruit. You don't have to do the parties. You don't buy the pink cars. Like all of that stuff. Um, she almost, in, I think it was 1988 ish, uh, Avon was nearly taken over by a hostile takeover bid first from Amway that they fought off, and six months later by Mary Kay. And they fought her off as well. Um, so Mary Kay was a bit of a wake-up call, and I think um, it's through that process that they realized that that old kind of ding-dong, like, come with us, um, had to change. They started to play with some multi-level marketing, not really, um, to try to give women a, uh, a chance at a bigger income uh, from sales. Uh, but otherwise, they just kind of, like, the Mary Kay commandos were, like, always at, like, arm's length. Um, and they knew they were there, but I think that Avon felt it was a behemoth and that it, it was never really um, a threat for Mary Kay. Ideologically, though, she, she represented a huge threat um, to Avon. Thank you, Tina. Let's come on. Right? Thank you. If this was a band, you'd say, give it up for Tina for, oh. for, for, for letting us know. I mean, this is, this is how the Avon collection got here. You've got to imagine this let Tina let loose on Avon thing what they do. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you, Tina, for that. Her book is on sale oh. in the back by coincidence. And if you were to buy a copy, I'm sure Tina would sign it for you. And the book is on sale for 
twenty dollars, which Ooh, is fifteen dollars off its regular price. Are you? We're taking... beating Amazon, okay? So talk about competition. So that's my sales pitch for the night. This is a sales event, so therefore we got to do that there. Uh, and to all of you, thank you for coming. Remember, come back for the author talk in December. There's a flyer out there. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, let's hope we all get past this thing. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.